Buenos días, bienvenidos. Esta es, esta es la Cátedra Abierta UDP en homenaje a Roberto Bolaño. Y llevamos años funcionando, eh, desde el año 2007 hemos recibido ya creo que más de 150 escritores intelectuales de distintas partes del mundo y de vez en cuando tenemos la fortuna de recibir personas que son capaces de eh, mezclar disciplinas, de dialogar con distintos lenguajes, imbricar la literatura eh, con, eh, con el mundo real, como le dicen los escritores. En este caso tenemos el privilegio de tener con nosotros a Philip Sanz. Philip es eh, un reconocido novelista. Él tiene eh, una novela en este minuto que está siendo ofrecida a, acá adelante, que es la que ustedes ven acá, que es la calle Este Oeste. Pero Philip no habría llegado hasta no, a esta novela si no hubiese sido por circunstancias eh, biográficas, además de su talento literario. Estas circunstancias biográficas son dos, en parte su genealogía familiar y cómo ésta está imbricada con la historia de Europa, específicamente también con eh, el desastre sucedido durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Y también está imbricado con sus intereses intelectuales y profesionales en su trabajo con el derecho. Él es un reconocido abogado, es un abogado internacional, experto en derechos humanos, ha trabajado en la Corte Internacional de La Haya y por supuesto tiene un vínculo muy importante con nuestro país, pues él, pues él estuvo involucrado en el juicio en contra de Augusto Pinochet, que comenzó el año 1998. Entonces, nos atan muchos vínculos con Philip Sanz, y esa es la razón por la cual nosotros lo hemos invitado a esta cátedra, eh, que no fue este año, sino que hace mucho tiempo. Es una relación que ha sido gradual y estamos muy felices de finalmente a haber podido eh, recibir a Philip Sanz. Pero siempre nosotros le pedimos a un escritor local que haga la suerte de eh, presentador intelectual de nuestros, eh, de nuestros invitados. Y en este caso hemos sido también favorecidos con la presencia de Alia Trabuco, que también es abogada y también una talentosísima escritora. Ella, eh, ella se dio a conocer en el medio con eh, la novela La Resta. Eh, ella estudió, después de estudiar Derecho, estudió eh, Creación Literaria en la Universidad de Nueva York, gracias a una beca Fulbright, y después siguió también su periplo, cruzó a Londres, eh, donde terminó un doctorado también, gracias a una beca eh, Conicet. Y ella, después de eh, La Resta, ella publicó el, bueno, el libro La Resta obtuvo el premio de las mejores obras literarias del año 2014 y este año, hace poco, en el 2019, ella publicó Las homicidas, que es un libro que narra eh, casos de mujeres eh, homicidas. Eh, un libro que ha sacado eh, mucha discusión eh, y que ha eh, revitalizado el debate eh, en torno a la no ficción y también eh, la labor de un escritor eh, en, este, en, en este ámbito. Ella, eh, bueno, yo la conocí a Alia cuando ella era una de las editoras de una excelente editorial, Las Brutas, eh, está instalada en Nueva York, una editorial que hasta el día de hoy se extraña. Dejo con ustedes entonces a Alia Trabuco. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Eh, muy buenos días. Primero que todo, eh, quiero dar las gracias a la Cátedra Abierta en homenaje a Roberto Bolaño de la Universidad Diego Portales por invitarme esta mañana. Estoy muy contenta de estar aquí eh, y de presentar al escritor y abogado Philip Sanz, uno de los juristas de derechos humanos más prestigiosos del mundo y autor, entre una decena de libros, de uno que me conmovió como pocos y que se trenza de una manera inusual con mi propia formación y mis lecturas. Leer es un gesto no exento de riesgos. A veces los lectores, las lectoras, movidos por fuerzas peligrosas, reseñas, recomendaciones, fajas, premios, escogemos sin querer el libro equivocado. 
Otras veces el libro no es el problema, sino el propio lector o lectora, nuestros referentes, nuestras resistencias e incluso nuestros prejuicios. Hay una tercera posibilidad, que el lector y el libro formen una gran dupla, pero que el contexto de algún modo se inmiscuya. O puede que el autor sea un problema, pues por más que se declare su muerte reiterada, parece estar más vivo que nunca. Existe, por suerte, una última alternativa. Encontrarse con un libro excepcional, en el momento preciso, y que ese libro abra una inesperada ruta al interior, vinculándose con nuestra propia cartografía literaria y al exterior, arrojando una nueva luz sobre la realidad. Esto es lo que describe mi lectura de Calle Este Oeste, de Philip Sands. Un tejido de memoria, ensayo, historia intelectual, crónica, biografía, arqueología lingüística y hasta novela policial, que leí con fascinación y urgencia, subrayando párrafos completos, pero que luego, al llegar al final, provocó en mí un gran desconcierto. Cuando cerré el libro y quise guardarlo en alguna de mis repisas, no supe qué lugar le correspondía dentro de mi biblioteca personal, dónde ubicarlo y quiénes serían buenos compañeros de casa. Philip Sands nació en Inglaterra, pero es también francés, así que su libro bien podía vivir en territorio europeo. La nacionalidad del autor, sin embargo, me pareció un criterio casi ofensivo, dado el tenor del libro. Así que de inmediato probé una nueva estrategia. Abrí un espacio en la zona reservada a la teoría, pero tras intentarlo un par de veces, tampoco quedé conforme con ese lugar. El libro regresó entonces a mi velador, y tras un tiempo, porque el tiempo es un excelente aliado de los grandes libros, Encontré una pista sobre el lugar de calle este oeste, no solo en mi biblioteca, sino en la historia reciente, en la literatura e incluso en la política contemporánea. Calle este oeste es un libro inusual, que hace del archivo su fuente primaria y de la memoria, de la pregunta por el legado, su compás moral e intelectual. El escenario es una pequeña y melancólica ciudad, Lviv, llamada Lemberg, Lvov o Lvov, según el país que la hubiera invadido, y donde coinciden cuatro personajes que jugarán un rol determinante en la vida de Sands, en la historia del siglo XX y, curiosamente, en la de nuestro país. Uno de los protagonistas es Leon Bushholz, el abuelo de Philip, un hombre misterioso y entrañable, cuyos silencios motivan a nuestro autor detective a indagar en una compleja trama de secretos y de dolores propios y heredados. Los otros dos son Rafael Lemkin y Hersch Lauterpach, juristas y profesores universitarios como el propio Sanz, quien hoy ejerce como académico en University College London y que ha participado, además, en algunos de los juicios internacionales más importantes de las últimas décadas. Pero mejor no me desvío en la vida de Philip, aunque de paso les cuento que es también creador del documental My Nazi Legacy y de, y de la performance A Song of Good and Evil. Es decir, se trata de un autor que transita con maestría del derecho a la literatura, al teatro, al cine. Y vuelvo ahora a concentrarme en la trama del libro. Lauterpach y Lemkin, los juristas, pueden ser leídos como eslabones fundamentales en la formación de Sands, alteregos que habitaron la misma ciudad que primero albergó y luego expulsó a su abuelo y que encontraron en el derecho, al igual que Philip, una herramienta para enfrentar la barbarie. Por último, además del abuelo y los abogados, aparece en escena otro personaje, Hans Frank, patrono de las artes, gobernador general de la Polonia ocupada y mano derecha de Hitler, y con él, su hijo, Niklas, heredero de un apellido y de una historia despreciable y vergonzosa y que permite a Sanz formular difíciles preguntas sobre el peso de la herencia y la genealogía. ¿De qué modos se entrecruzan las vidas de estos personajes? De maneras que solo la realidad y no la ficción parecería admitir. A partir de pistas que Sanz desentraña con ojo detectivesco, asistimos a una narración conmovedora de sus vidas cotidianas, una historia de persecución y violencia, de resistencia y lucidez. Pero esta descripción, y aquí les debo pedir disculpas, no le hace justicia al libro que hoy nos convoca. Es cierto que Calle Este Oeste narra magistralmente biografías singulares y anécdotas inolvidables, pero su brillantez, su hazaña, es que su impulso narrativo converge con una inquietud intelectual igualmente apasionante, la pregunta por el rol del derecho 
y de la justicia de cara al horror. Philip Sands, en este libro singularísimo, en su doble impulso literario y teórico, nos invita a rastrear el origen de dos conceptos clave, dos ideas que recuerdo haber estudiado juiciosamente cuando era estudiante de Derecho, que nos marcaron a todos quienes seguimos en vivo y en directo la detención de Pinochet en Londres, y que, finalmente, me ofrecieron una respuesta a la pregunta que tanto me desconcertaba, ¿dónde debía vivir este libro? En medio del auge del nazismo, intentando proteger los acotados espacios donde el pensamiento crítico y la libertad eran todavía posibles, Lauterbach y Lemkin, sin conocerse, sin saber que los movería el mismo impulso, se quedaron sin palabras ante el descalabro que se desataba frente a sus ojos. Decir asesinato o matanza, homicidio o persecución, dolo o culpa, parecía un absoluto sinsentido. Estas palabras, de pronto, ya no eran capaces de nombrar la realidad. El lenguaje había alcanzado su límite y con él había llegado también a su límite la herramienta que Lauterpach y Lemkin conocían a la perfección, el derecho. Sin embargo, y aquí surgen la perseverancia y la rebeldía, Lauterpach y, Lem y Lemkin no se dieron por vencidos. Volvieron una y otra vez a sus apuntes, a sus libros e incluso a su imaginación para buscar allí algo que los protegiera frente al abuso y la violencia, una herramienta tardía, acaso definida por su destiempo, que no serviría para salvar a sus propias familias, pero que sí les permitiría arrojar una bengala hacia el futuro, hacia nosotros, con la esperanza de que si volvía a caer otra noche así de larga, así de honda, su luz nos iluminara e impidiera la repetición de un horror semejante o, al menos, lo castigara severamente. Esa bengala no fue más que una idea, o en realidad, dos. Para Lauterpach se llamó Crímenes contra la Humanidad, un concepto que pretendía proteger al individuo frente a abusos de gran escala. Y para Lemkin se llamó Genocidio, un delito centrado en la protección de los grupos frente a persecuciones selectivas. Dos conceptos que hoy parecen inmemoriales, pero que hasta entonces no existían, o no como tales, y que estos abogados consiguieron introducir en los grandes salones del Tribunal de Nuremberg, permitiendo, entre otras condenas, la del propio Hans Frank, el hombre que sin que ellos lo supieran había sido uno de los responsables del exterminio de sus propias familias. Un gesto doloroso y valiente, un acto de osadía intelectual en medio del horror, una suerte de fuga hacia un futuro incierto que de algún modo les salvó la vida, tal como el imperativo testimonial tal vez le haya salvado la vida a Primo Levi, o como la obsesión por el lenguaje, por dejar un registro discursivo de, del totalitarismo alemán, le dio una razón para sobrevivir al filólogo Víctor Klemperer. Y es que mientras Lauterpach y Lemkin se quedaban sin palabras, sin delitos apropiados, sin legislación ni precedentes que les permitieran resistir a la violencia desatada en Europa, Víctor Klemperer, a su vez, se obsesionó con las palabras. Expulsado de su trabajo y proscrito de impartir clases en la universidad, sufriendo en carne propia los campos de trabajo forzado, Klemperer se abocó secretamente a construir una poderosa máquina de desmontaje que le permitió examinar, sílaba a sílaba, el entramado lingüístico nazi. Klemperer, en la lengua del Tercer Reich y en sus monumentales diarios, se dedicó a lo que sabía hacer mejor, coleccionar palabras. En medio del hostigamiento cotidiano y de la sistemática destrucción de una vida vivible, el filólogo se dedicó a estudiar el lenguaje del nazismo. Se enfocó en las abreviaciones y siglas, en la adopción indiscriminada de ciertos prefijos y, sobre todo, en cómo desde el aparato propagandístico se le daba un nuevo uso a viejas palabras. <coughs> Términos comunes y corrientes que al no cargar de manera explícita con insinuaciones violentas, actuaron en sus palabras, y aquí cito, como dosis ínfimas de arsénico. Un veneno que la sociedad alemana habría tragado sin darse cuenta, pero que al cabo de un tiempo produjo el efecto tóxico. Entre estas palabras, algunas fueron empleadas para nombrar específicamente la aniquilación, liquidar o solu solución final, entre otras. Y son ellas las que, hasta el día de hoy, portan el signo de la infamia nazi. Pero hay otros términos, menos imbuidos de muerte e incluso anteriores al nazismo, que han continuado su trayectoria y han recobrado vigor. 
Soberanía es uno de ellos, empleado hoy para justificar la expulsión de inmigrantes y refugiados, mientras que patria, nación y seguridad son tal vez las palabras más frecuentes a la hora de introducir discursos xenófobos y nacionalistas. Basta escuchar a Jair Bolsonaro y su desprecio hacia el orden internacional, o leer el reciente discurso de Donald Trump ante las Naciones Unidas, o ver a Boris Johnson en el Parlamento inglés hablar de rendición y enemigos, o prestar atención a nuestra versión local, José Antonio Cast, para comprobar cómo el lenguaje ha vuelto a jugar un rol central en el actual movimiento discursivo y político hacia la intolerancia y el autoritarismo. Calle Este Oeste tendió para mí un nuevo puente entre lecturas de otros, modos, de, de otros modos desconectadas. Hablo de los puntos de contacto entre el derecho y la literatura, y también de una escritura que, en su hibridez, parece inaugurar un nuevo género. Y arrojó además una luz muy clara sobre un presente donde se ha instalado un discurso que debería encender nuestras alarmas. Se trata de una obra que retoma el impulso lingüístico de Víctor Klemperer, y me atrevo a agregar aquí a la brillante escritora Hertha Müller, cuya obra también encarna estrategias de resistencia poética y literaria frente a los embates del totalitarismo, y donde Philip Sands ya no solo rastrea el veneno y sus consecuencias, y sus consecuencias sino que, y aquí está la contribución, el riesgo, se pregunta por su antídoto con espíritu crítico, lucidez y algo que hoy en día hace muchísima falta, una necesaria y tal vez vital dosis de optimismo. Calle Este Oeste puede ser leído como una arqueología lingüística de esos dos conceptos que cambiaron la cara de la justicia internacional. Puede ser leído también como un libro que reúne ejemplos de cómo pequeñas acciones e ideas pueden derivar en hechos terribles y cómo otras, igualmente pequeñas, pueden ponerle fin o al menos intentarlo. Es Asimismo, un libro que a partir del rescate de biografías olvidadas formula preguntas centrales para el presente. ¿Qué es la identidad? ¿Quiénes somos individual y colectivamente? ¿Qué es la memoria? ¿Es posible heredarla? ¿Es posible escapar de ella? Y es, por último, un homenaje a aquellos que encontraron en el lenguaje su tabla de salvación y también a tantos otros, tantos miles, que no pudieron salir de un pavoroso silencio. Calle este oeste, como la lengua del Tercer Reich, rastrea ciertas palabras y las detona en el presente con la esperanza de que esa recuperación y relectura sea una bengala en este contexto donde el lenguaje, una vez más, parece cargarse de veneno. Y cierro con esa palabra tan peligrosa, veneno, y una última reflexión. Hace algún tiempo leí que en algunos bosques muy cerca de las plantas y los hongos venenosos, se puede encontrar, oculto, el antídoto preciso. Ignoro si esto será verdad y me temo que no lo sea. Lo que sí creo es que hay algo en esa posibilidad, en ese extraño punto de contacto entre muerte y sobrevivencia, que, al menos como metáfora, como imagen, puede servirnos. Y el mensaje tal vez sea el siguiente. Debemos aprender dónde buscar, dónde mirar, ¿Dónde leer? Ahí está calle este oeste, cerca de tantos libros que nos advierten sobre los peligros del autoritarismo y del lenguaje que lo nutre y fortalece. En mi pequeña biblioteca se encuentra cerca de la lengua del Tercer Reich, próximo a Primo Levi, junto a Hannah Arendt y a Hertha Müller, y ciertamente cerca, muy cerca, de nuestra historia reciente. Me refiero a la dictadura chilena y a su bibliografía de horrores, ignominias y también de resistencias. Calle Este Oeste nos recuerda que el autoritarismo ha existido más de una vez y en más de un territorio. Nos advierte que las palabras más comunes pueden volverse tóxicas, que incluso hoy pueden reaparecer, pero que hay una historia no tan lejana a la que acudir cuando necesitemos escudos, antídotos o al menos una luz, una bengala en tiempos de oscuridad. Olvidar esa historia. Nuestra historia no es ni puede ser una alternativa. Y ahí está este libro importante y necesario para recordarnos dónde buscar en tiempos confusos como estos. Gracias. Well, you've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> It's a wonderful um, introduction and I'm hugely grateful to it. Uh, Alia has become in 
recent times a very good friend, and it's incredibly nice to be here with you, and I thank her, but also I thank the Cathedra Abierta and Celia and Rodrigo, and it's, as you will hear in a moment, very timely for me, indeed, to be here uh, in Chile. I'm very happy to be in this country with which I feel I have a special uh, and particular connection. We're gathered here today as a group, uh, but each of us is, of course, also an individual. And long ago, I came to understand that my various activities, writing, teaching, litigating, are all informed by my personal background. I am not a blank slate. None of us is a blank slate when we come into the world. Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, wrote a rather wonderful autobiography called Interesting Times. And in it, there's a section where he recognizes the complex connection between who we are and what we do. He notes what he calls the profound way in which the interweaving of one person's life and times and the observation of those lives and times help us to shape and understand historical analysis. I'm not a historian, I'm a lawyer, and I'm a lawyer who focuses on international issues, but my professional and academic interest is a desire really to understand how the law actually works, how rules are created, how they're interpreted, how they're applied, how they affect behavior. My curiosity about a person's life and times is concerned with the way it might inform the world. And my experiences, after more than a quarter of a century in many different courtrooms, points to a very clear conclusion. Individual lives, individual memory, and personal histories really matter, and they really make a difference. East West Street took seven years to write. It's not about the life of one person, but four people. And I suppose, really, it seeks to understand how the particular circumstances of each man contributed to the road he took and how the four roads thus traveled changed the system of international rules that is my daily work. Of course, as many of you know, the work also touches on a more personal theme. Alia didn't focus so much on that aspect. How those four interweaving lives influenced my path. And in going along that path, it raises some pretty fundamental questions about identity. Who am I? How do I wish to be defined as an individual or as a member of a group or more than one group? How do I want the law to protect me as an individual or as a member of a group? These are very pertinent questions today, not least in this country. And they're as pertinent as they were when the legal concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide were invented in 1945. So why did I write East West Street? It came about, frankly, by chance. In the spring of 2010, I was carrying on my business in the classroom, in courtrooms, writing articles. An invitation came from Ukraine, an email from an obscure university in a city now called Lviv, it used to be called Lemberg during the Austro-Hungarian period until 1918, then it became Lvov until 1939, and then after 1945, Lviv. It's one and the same place. Would I like to come and visit to deliver a public lecture on my work, the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide, my academic work, the Nuremberg trial, and the consequences of the trial for our modern world? Yes, I replied instantly, I would. I'd long been fascinated by the myths of Nuremberg, the words, the images, the sounds. I was mesmerized by tiny points of detail in the transcript, by the terrible evidence, by the books, the memoirs, the diaries, the testimony, the lives of the judges, the love affairs that I discovered went on behind the scenes. I loved the film Judgment at Nuremberg, made in 1961, which won an Oscar, and in particular, Spencer Tracy's momentary and totally unexpected flirtation with Marlena Dietrich and the simplicity of his closing final line in his judgment. We stand for truth, 
justice, and the value of a single human life. The Nuremberg Judgment blew a wind into the germinal sails of a human rights movement. Definitely, it was Victor's justice, but the case was catalytic. For the first time in human history, the leaders of a country were put on trial before an international court. That had never happened before. It opened a door to events that led eventually to what happened in London in 1998, felt so closely in this country. My work as a barrister, rather than my writings, I suspect, caused the invitation to be sent from Lviv. In the summer of 1998, I had been peripherally involved in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of the Statute of the International Criminal Court with, gen with jurisdiction over crimes against humanity and genocide. The essential difference between the two is on who is protected and why. If 3,000 people are systematically murdered or disappeared, it will always be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends on the intentions of the killers or the disappearers and the ability to prove that intention. To establish a genocide, you have to prove that the act of killing is motivated by something called a special intention, the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. The two crimes operate side by side, and they overlap. Every genocide is a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity is a genocide. A few months after the two crimes were inscribed into the Rome Statute, Senator Pinochet was arrested in London. People have forgotten, but it was in the initial arrest warrant on charges both of genocide and crimes against humanity. They had been laid against him by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords ruled famously, and in some places controversially, that even as a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the jurisdiction of the English courts. Whatever you think about the judgment, it was totally novel and totally revolutionary. In the years that followed, the gates of international justice slowly creaked open after five decades of silence. Cases from the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda soon landed on my desk, and others in relation to Congo, Libya, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, Guantanamo, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, and the list goes on and on and on. They were always based on the new rules that came about in that 1945 moment, that revolutionary moment, which recognized for the first time that the rights of the sovereign over its people are not absolute. They are limited. I became involved in many cases of mass killing. I have seen a great number of mass graves. Some of those cases raised claims of crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals on a large scale. Others gave rise to allegations of genocide, the destruction of groups. And so these two concepts grew side by side with a different emphasis, one on the individual, the other on the group. Over time, of course, genocide seems to have emerged as the crime of crimes, a hierarchy that unhappily leaves the unfortunate suggestion killing of a large number of individuals is somehow less terrible than the killing of a group. Occasionally, I'd pick up hints about the origins and purposes of the two terms and the connection to arguments that were first made in Nuremberg's courtroom 600, but I never really inquired as to what exactly had happened at Nuremberg. I knew a little about the stories, the personal stories behind the trial, but not much. So I thought the invitation gives me a chance to look into a little more detail. Now I could say that I made the trip to Lviv to give a lecture, but that is quite simply not true. I made the trip because of this young man, 10 years old, who became my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, mentioned by Alia, who was born in the city of Lviv in 1904. When he spoke in German, he called it Lemberg, when he spoke in Polish, he called it Lwów. In his wonderful slim volume, Moi Lwów, written in 1946, published in many languages, but I think not yet Spanish. Oh, it is in Spanish. It is in Spanish. The fine Polish poet, Joseph Wittlin, describes what he calls the essence of being a Lwówian. It is, he writes, 
an extraordinary mixture of nobility and roguery, of wisdom and imbecility, of poetry and vulgarity. But, Fickling tells us, nostalgia likes to falsify the flavors. It tells us to taste nothing but the sweetness of Lvoff. I know, Fitlin writes, I know people for whom Lvoff was a cup of gall. And it was a cup of gall for my grandfather, buried very deep in a hinterland of which he never once spoke to me or my brother. His silence covered the wounds of a family he left behind in 1914 when he moved to Vienna and then lost forever after 1939. But the moment I first set foot in that city in the autumn of 2010, it felt incredibly familiar. It was like meeting a long-lost relative. Why I had that reaction caused me to explore psychoanalytical writings on the relationship not between parent and child, but between grandparent and grandchild. And a friend directed me to the work of Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham, two Hungarian psychoanalysts. They wrote, what haunts us are the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And these are the words with which Calle Este Hueste begins. My grandfather's secret, which I knew nothing about, was that he came from a huge family, one that was centered in Lemberg and the surrounding areas. Dozens of uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, and distant relatives. The family grew and grew until war came. By the spring of 1949, he was the only member of a family of more than 80 in the district of Galicia who had survived, but he never once talked about it. In 1939, he fled Vienna for Paris. And in preparing this lecture, my mother, for the first time, I was 50 years old by then, gave me access to all of his papers. And amongst the papers, I found this document, which translated into English says, the Jew, Buchholz, Morris Leon, is required to leave the territory of the German Reich by December the 25th, 1938. He was expelled because he had been made stateless and because he was a Jew. I had always assumed that Leon had left Vienna with his wife Rita, my grandmother, and his one-year-old daughter Ruth, my mother. But with these materials, I learned for the first time that this was not the case, that he left by himself, that his daughter traveled to Paris a few months later in the summer of 1939, and that for some strange reason, his wife remained in Vienna for another three years. Something else must have intervened in the lives of those three people to cause the separation. Why did Leon leave Vienna by himself? How on earth did my mother get to Paris by herself, aged less than one? Why did Rita remain in Vienna, allowing herself to be separated from her only child? Any parent, any mother will know what that would mean in real terms. These were very big questions, and I found many more documents amongst Leon's papers, hunting for clues. I am a litigator. This is a litigator's book. A litigator is a sort of lesser amateur historian come psychiatrist. And you learn, as a litigator, that every scrap of paper, every photograph, is capable of hiding information that is not immediately knowable. This is the muck of evidence, and I love it. I've learned to look very carefully, to keep an open mind always, to attend to the unexpected, to find the dots, to try to join the dots, and to persist, because nothing is ever only what it seems. And two items stood out. The first was this, a tiny scrap of paper, two centimeters by three centimeters. It was folded in half, one side was blank, the other bore a name and address written firmly in pencil. Miss Tilney, Bluebell Road, Manuka, Norwich, Angleterre. And the second item that interested me was this small black and white photograph showing a middle-aged man staring intently into the camera with a faint smile across his lips. He wears a pinstripe suit. He has a white handkerchief folded neatly 
into his breast pocket. He wears a white shirt and a polka dot bow tie, which to my viewing emphasizes a sense of mischief. On the back of the photograph, in blue ink, is written the words, Herzliche Grüße aus Wien, September 1949, warmest wishes from Vienna. And there's a signature, firm but indecipherable. Who was Miss Tilney? Who's the man in the bow tie? I ask my mother, and she tells me I don't know, and I tell her I don't believe you. I pin the scraps on the wall above my desk where they remain for four years, and I return to the lecture I had to write for Lviv. I've taken you off on a personal detour, but let's go back to the lecture and to the first of several coincidences that I encountered. I was immensely surprised to learn that summer that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law in the summer of 1945 was actually a student at Lviv University, and he came from the city, but the people who invited me to give the lecture didn't know it. His name was Hirsch Lauterpacht. He was born in the small town of Zhulkiev, about 15 miles north of Lviv. He later enrolled at the university law faculty, and in 1919, he moved to Vienna, where he was a student with Hans Kelsen. He spends four years, obtains a doctorate in law, moves to Britain with a new wife. He becomes a renowned academic, first at the London School of Economics, then at Cambridge. In 1945, he publishes a book to which he gives the title An International Bill of the Rights of Man. It offers a wholly new idea to recognize that every human being has rights under international law as an individual. It's a collection of words, but it is absolutely revolutionary, and it informs and creates the new modern system of human rights. He prepares a draft convention, which gives effect to his personal credo that the individual human being is the ultimate unit of all law. In April 45, as the war in Europe ends, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin decide that the senior Nazis will be tried in Germany. The British hire Lauterpacht to join the prosecution team. He will work with Robert Jackson, the chief American prosecutor. Jackson travels to London to draft the charter. The four powers, the US, Britain, the Soviet Union, and France, can't agree about the list of crimes over which the tribunal will have jurisdiction. Jackson is driven up to Cambridge where he meets with Lauterpacht, his old friend. They have tea in Lauterpacht's garden. Here you see Lauterpacht in his garden. The two men discuss the list of possible crimes. It is Lauterpacht who has the idea that it might be a good idea to put titles into the charter, because that will help public understanding and add legitimacy to the exercise. Jackson reacts positively. Lauterpacht thinks, I'll give him another idea on atrocities against civilians, on which the Soviets and the Americans are deeply divided. Lauterpacht has a long-standing academic interest in this matter, but also a personal interest, because he has no news still about his family who remains behind in Lemberg. Why not, he says, why not refer to atrocities against individuals as crimes against humanity. And here you see the words written in 1945 in his own hand. The term will cover massive atrocities against individuals, torture, murder, disappearance, and introduce a new concept into international law. Jackson likes the idea and takes it with him back to London. Lauterpacht tells the Foreign Office as they incorporate the term into the Nuremberg Charter it's an innovation, but absolutely necessary in the circumstances. Preparing the lecture, you'll recall, also required me to focus on the concept of genocide, which brings me to a second surprise. For the man who invented that word also came from Lviv and remarkably also went to the same law school, and the folks who invited me had no idea. His name was Raphael Lemkin, the law school was then called Lvov, and he arrived two years after Lauterpacht left. He stays until 1926, gets a doctorate in criminal law. He becomes a public prosecutor in Warsaw, and in 1933 for the League of Nations, 
he invents the idea for a new international crime to combat what he calls barbarity and vandalism. His focus, unlike Lauterpacht, is on groups, not individuals. But the timing is terrible. Hitler has just come to power in Germany. In 1939, Germany invades Poland. Lemkin flees. He visits his parents for one last time and makes his way to Sweden, spends a year there, then leaves for America to Durham, North Carolina, and Duke University. He's been offered a place of academic refuge. He travels with little money, no personal belongings, but a vast quantity of suitcases. Each suitcase is filled with thousands of pages of paper, decrees that have been promulgated by the Nazis in occupied countries. He's gathered the material in Sweden, carted it halfway across the world, and now analyzes it. In November 1944, he's published, he publishes a book to which he gives the unexciting title, Axis Rule of Occupied Europe. It contains an analysis of Nazi actions. And chapter nine of the book has as its title a completely new word, a word which he has invented, genocide. Here you see it in his own hand, written in 1944. It's an amalgam of the Greek word genos, meaning tribe or race, and the Latin word sede, which means killing. In the summer of 1945, Lemkin is hired by the Americans to work on the war crimes trial with Robert Jackson, but in a separate team from Lauterpacht. He wants the senior Nazis to be indicted for genocide for the destruction of groups, and is greatly disappointed when the Nuremberg Charter includes crimes against humanity, but makes no mention of genocide or the destruction of groups. He flies to London to draft the indictment of the individual defendants and is persistent. There's opposition from Jackson's team, under pressure from southern senators who don't like the idea of African Americans invoking genocide, and from the British who worry about the legacy of colonialism. But against the odds, his word makes it into the indictment as a war crime. This is the first time the word is used in an international legal instrument with his definition, the extermination of racial and religious groups, and it mentions his list, Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and others. The trial opens on November the 20th, 1945. Lauterpacht is present in the courtroom with the British team pushing for the protection of individuals. Lemkin stays in Washington pushing for the protection of groups. One of the 22 men in the dock is this man, Hans Frank, the fourth character in my book. He too was a lawyer, an early supporter of Hitler, who appointed him as Governor General of Nazi-occupied Poland in October 1939. Three years later, on the 1st of August 1942, Frank visits Lemberg and Galicia newly incorporated into his territory. He stays with Otto Wächter, who is his deputy, who is the main subject of my next book, The Rat Line, and Wächter's wife, Charlotte, who is in love, although Frank doesn't know it, with Frank's wife. Frank hosts a concert, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and gives a series of elegant speeches in which he announces the elimination of half a million Jews in the city and the surrounding areas. Amongst those who are caught up in the horrors that follow Frank's visit and his choice of words are the families, friends, and teachers of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, and, of course, my grandfather's family. He becomes the point of connection between the three men. And for each family, there is only a single survivor. Three years later, in May 1945, Frank is caught by the Americans near his home in Bavaria. He has with him his diaries, 42 volumes, and a fantastic collection of artwork. And when I say fantastic, I mean fantastic. It includes this painting, Cecilia Gallerani, by Leonardo da Vinci. Frank took the painting from his private office at the Wawel Castle in Krakow, where it hangs once again today. His son, Nicholas, tells me that as a young boy, his father would make him stand before this painting and slick back his hair, just like Cecilia Gallerani. The little boy was frightened of the painting. He thought the animal was a rat. It is an ermine, and she is the lady with an ermine. And now Frank is in the dock, and he's charged both with crimes against humanity and genocide. 
On the first day of the trial, the Soviet prosecutors take the judges to the horrors of what happened in the days following Frank's visit to Lemberg. 130,000 people killed in just a few weeks, including 8,000 children right in the heart of the city. As the words are spoken in court, Lauterpacht and Lemkin do not know whether the victims, those individuals, include their family members. They do not know that the man they are prosecuting, Hans Frank, is directly responsible for the fate of their own families. And as a litigator, I have to say, that touches me very deeply. On this day, for the first time ever, November the 20th, the term genocide and crimes against humanity are used in open court. I knew Lauterpacht and Frank to be in courtroom 600 and wonder if there's a photograph. Lauterpacht's son, Ellie, tells me there is no photograph, but as with my mother, I do not believe him. I persist and I find what it is that I'm looking for, an unusual photograph taken from an unfamiliar angle. In the top left-hand corner, sitting at the British table of delegates, is Lauterpacht, hands clenched, listening to a Soviet prosecutor. If you turn your eyes down to the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a man in a white suit leaning forward. That is Hermann Goering in his oversized outfit. And then if you go a few people to Goering's left, you see Hans Frank. This photograph, too, I find touching. Lauterpacht and Frank together in the same room. One knows what the other may have done to his family. The other has no idea of their personal connection. The trial lasts for a full year, and judgment is handed down on September the 30th and October the 1st, 1946. Of course, I don't this morning have time to address what transpired over the course of a remarkable year as the lives of the three men became increasingly intertwined. The historian Anthony Beaver has described what he reads in these pages as being of a kind that no novel could ever possibly match. They would just say this could not possibly be true. Life as literature and more, it might be said. The simple point that I make is that personal journeys coincided. They changed the course of legal history and then they changed the course of history itself. The words and ideas of Lauterpacht and Lemkin have influenced politics, history, culture, my life, and here in Chile, each of your lives. The concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide have not, however, existed, as many people believe, since time immemorial. They are the product of creative, inventive minds, of two men, experience forged on the anvil of a single city in the middle of Europe. Quite why Lauterpacht opted for the protection of individuals and what caused Lemkin to embrace the protection of the group is a matter of speculation. They had very similar backgrounds. They studied at the same university. They had the same teachers. Indeed, you can trace the origins of the two terms to Lemberg after the First World War. You can trace it to the law faculty. You can even, as I have done, trace it to one man that the two had in common, Julius Makarovich, a Polish professor of criminal law. You can even follow the term the terms to a single building and to a single room, still a working classroom today. This is the room in which Makarevich taught and in which I imagine Lauterpacht and Lemkin to have learned. Yet curiously, despite their common origins, interests and journeys, and the fact that I have on occasion been able to find them in the same city on the same day, although not Nuremberg and not courtroom 600, where they missed each other sometimes by only a few hours, it seems that Lauterpacht and Lemkin never actually met. Their ideas inform my working life, and I frequently wondered how it is that I ended up doing the work that I do and how it was me that came across this story. My own quest was surely driven in some way by personal history, a legacy of memory and stories buried deep in a crypt of family secrets. The quest did include a lot more detective work. I found who Miss Tilney was. It took a long time. And I learned quite what she had done and came to understand why my mother and I and my brother have enormous reason to be grateful to a woman of very great courage. She was a missionary, a Christian missionary at the Surrey Chapel in Norwich who was motivated by the sermons of her pastor and in particular by Paul's letter to the Romans. Alia was saying, how words matter. I exist and I am before you today 
because of her reading of a single line from chapter 10, verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans, which motivated her to travel from Paris to Vienna and save the life of not just one small child, but many people, Jews and non-Jews alike, who faced persecution. I also uncovered the identity of the man in a bow tie. That took me first towards the east, then towards the west, across rivers and an ocean, with the help of a large pile of old Austrian telephone directories, a crazy private detective and wonderful person in Vienna, and finally, I am very sorry to say, solving the mystery with the use of Facebook. I ended up in an attic in Massapequa, Long Island, New York, where the granddaughter of the man in the bow tie found this photograph. My grandmother with two men in white socks, one of whom was the man in the bow tie, and he was her lover. One discovery catalyzed another. The identity of the man who seems to have been my grandfather's true love, his closest friend, Max. Incidentally, if any of us are inclined to have an affair, we should not exclude the possibility that 75 years later, one of our grandchildren may discover with absolute certainty what has happened. <laughs> Efforts like this take years and involve the assistance of a range of remarkable individuals to whom I pay real tribute. But these are the requirements of an exercise, it might be said, of personal archaeological enterprise. Perhaps even more remarkably and entirely unexpectedly, I learned of something of a direct connection between my family and the Lauterpax and the Lemkins. I was somewhat surprised to learn that my great-grandmother, Amalia Flaschner Buchholz, was actually born and lived in the small town of Zulkiev, which those of you who have been particularly attentive will recall is the place, amazingly, where Hirsch Lauterpack was born. Not only that, but they were born and lived on the very same street, just a few hundred yards apart. It was called Lemberger Straße back then. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, Lauterpack's son and only child was my first teacher of international law at Cambridge University in 1982. I became an international lawyer because of him. He was my mentor, my colleague, my friend for 35 years. He died a couple of years ago. It was only in 2014, after 33 years working together, that we learned that we shared a connection to the very same street, the street the wonderful writer Joseph Roth called East West Street. And then I learned that Amalia, whose life began on the street of the Lauterpacks, ended in September the 1942, on the 23rd of that month, in the kingdom of Hans Frank. The last street she walked down was called Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven. And it was the street that led from a railway platform to a gas chamber at Treblinka. A month after she entered that gas chamber, Lemkin's parents, Bella and Joseph, walked down the same street and perished in the same gas chamber. Amalia's life was, it could be said, caught between the bookends of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, as mine is also, but in a very different way. How do you begin to understand these points of connection? The starting point, of course, is the ideas of Lauterpacht and Lemkin and the enduring relevance of their ideas today. The relationship between the individual and the group has been contested across the ages. Lauterpacht believed passionately that we should always emphasize the protection of the individual. And he would argue today that Lemkin's invention of the concept of genocide has been useless in practical terms and that it is politically dangerous because it will tend to replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group. And in a way, my own practical experience concords with that view in many of the cases I've been involved in. I've observed for myself that by focusing on the protection of one group against another, there's a tendency to reinforce the sense of them and us, to amplify the power of group identity and association, to reinforce the sense of victimhood of the targeted group and hatred towards the perpetrators as a mass. But of course, I understand the reality of what Lemkin was trying to do, and he was certainly right to recognize that reality, that in most, if not all cases, mass atrocity is always targeted, not against individuals, 
but against people who happen to be identified as a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time or place. And Lemkin would say, and it's a powerful argument, that the law must reflect that reality, that it must recognize and give legitimacy to that feeling which each of us has of association with one or more groups. But as I indicated, I'm concerned about the hierarchy of putting genocide at the top of the list of horrors. So what is the enduring legacy of these two legal terms? Today, we know a poison of xenophobia and nationalism is once again coursing its way through the veins of Europe and many other parts of the world. The strong man as leader is back, including on this continent. I see it for myself on journeys to the central and eastern parts of our European continent, to Hungary, Ukraine. Those of you who saw the film My Nazi Legacy, the BBC documentary, will have seen me standing in a faraway field just a couple of years ago, watching people dressed in SS uniforms celebrate the creation of Otto Wächter's Waffen-SS Galicia Division. And I've seen it too on my journeys in writing The Ratline, the new book, which was also a BBC podcast from last year. Traveling across Europe, in Austria and Poland and other places, it's hard to avoid what seems to be stirring and wondering to where this will lead. The generation that experienced the horrors of the 1930s, that lived through the Second World War, that knows why states came together after 1945 to create the idea of a United Nations and the idea of human rights, to adopt a universal declaration and a convention to prevent genocide, that generation will soon be gone. Perhaps it is the disappearance of actual memory, the disappearance of actual experience that allows our politicians to occupy a new space, to take for granted what happened in 1945. Indeed, it's impossible for me not to have gone through the experience of writing East West Street, an immersion in the world of the years between 1914 and 1945, and not feel an acute sense of anxiety as to what is stirring. Not so long ago, he who is the President of the United States called for a total and complete shutdown for Muslims entering the United States. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom today is now in the daily habit of targeting people because they are a member of a group he happens not to like. He calls them collaborators. The idea of targeting people, whole groups of people, not because of what they've actually done, but because they happen to be a member of a group, has a long and dark history. Primo Levi put the point crisply in the preface to his book, If This Is a Man. We didn't coordinate, and it's very interesting <laughs> that we've ended up perching on the same places. He wrote, and I quote, many people, many people, many nations can find themselves holding more or less wittingly that every stranger is an enemy. And when this happens, when the unspoken dogma becomes the major premise in a syllogism, then at the end of the chain, there is always the concentration camp. One thing leads to another. When you start to single out people, not for what they might have done, but because they happen to be a member of a particular group, or perhaps because you identify yourself as a citizen of the world. Three years ago, the former British Prime Minister, Theresa May, seems to have been blissfully unaware of the implications of what she was saying when she boasted, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. Her words reminded me of a passage in Stefan Zweig's magnificent book, The World of Yesterday, required reading for our times, published posthumously in 1942 after Zweig committed suicide on this continent. For almost half a century, Zweig wrote, I trained my heart to beat as the heart of a citizen of the world. On the day I lost my Austrian passport, I discovered that when you lose your native land, you are losing more than a patch of territory within set borders. Or, as the fine Chilean poet Raul Zurita put it six decades later, I weep for a country that is my enemy. One thing leads to another across time and place. This you know better than anyone in Chile. How familiar, I thought, as I read Roberto Bolaño's By Night in Chile, as Father Sebastian Urrutia Lacroix takes us on an inner journey that starts with Ernst Junger and ends with Augusto Pinochet 
passing over a place called the Hill of Heroes, which happens to exist also in Lemberg. Indeed, this part of the world right now is very much on my mind. Argentina is the imagined end point of The Rat Line, the next book, a tale of love and denial of Nazis and spies and Rome and a couple called the Wächters, Charlotte and Otto. He disappeared in 1945. He was indicted for mass murder. Four years later, he reached the Vatican. He was lodged secretly at a monastery called P Vigna Pia. He occupied a monk's cell that had recently been vacated by an old comrade, as he described him, who fled to Syria and eventually arrived here in Santiago, where it is said after September 1973, he obtained gainful employment in the intelligence services of the new administration. The old comrade who lived in Otto Wächter's cell was called Walter Rauf, and he and others of his time in Chile are the subject of the book that follows the rat line, the third in the trilogy. Everything is connected. I never expected to write one book, never mind a trilogy of sorts, a curiously unbroken line from the moment of my grandfather's birth in 1904 via Lauterpacht and Lemkin through Nuremberg onto Rome and eventually here, Santiago, in 1973 and then in October 1998 to London and a trial there and curiously to Paris and to my grandfather's internment at a cemetery at Pantin, outside the gates of which on a morning in October, I met my wife, who told me of the dire consequences that would follow if I accepted the invitation to act as a lawyer for he who once served as president of Chile, a man indicted for crimes against humanity and genocide. One thing leads to another. Round and round we go, in a sort of state of constant interconnection. You call it, I think, rearranging the meat. Each of us haunted by the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. Perhaps it's the fact of our haunting and the discovery of that fact alongside the interminable legacy of memory and experience. Perhaps that might not actually destroy us, but could make us stronger. Thank you. Excelente intervención de ambos autores, como se nota cómo están entretejiendo el, el, la reflexión muy profunda del derecho eh, junto con esta, esta narración. Eh, pero ahora tenemos este, tele, este, este micrófono para hacer preguntas desde el público, para quienes quieran. Eh, yo supongo que porque tenemos una audiencia... But, but Rodrigo, we start with her. Yes, of course. I was going that way. <laughs> bueno, como tenemos una audiencia que también viene del derecho, supongo que van a ser capaces de sobreponerse a, eh, a, esta, a esta timidez nacional. Uh -huh. Así que eh, eh, quizás, Alia, ¿quieres comenzar? Eh, sí, feliz eh, de, de empezar. Tengo una, una cantidad de preguntas peligrosas, eh, así que voy a intentar... Eh, eh, a, aprovechar los silencios que haya lo más posible. Eh, primero quería decir que, que escuchar a Philip también me produjo una sensación similar a la que me produjo la lectura del libro, que tiene que ver con una conmoción que es simultáneamente afectiva, emocional e intelectual, ¿no? Y es ese trenzado el que a mí me, me resulta especialmente impresionante. Eh, y y que, quiero hacer una pregunta que, que es tal vez más formal y que tiene que ver con el final eh, del libro, eh, específicamente eh, con la decisión de cerrar eh, esta tremenda investigación, este tremendo texto híbrido, eh, justo antes del epílogo, eh, no con una palabra, sino con una imagen, eh, en un libro que está profundamente anclado en el lenguaje, en la preocupación por el lenguaje, eh, Philip decide eh, cerrar eh, la historia con, con, con esta fotografía, ¿no?, 
eh, que es la, la imagen del cadáver de Hans Frank. Eh, y quería eh, preguntarle por esa decisión, eh, yo sé que en el arreglo de, de, de visual también de este libro no es casual y quería preguntarle por esta decisión en particular, que me parece una decisión eh, eh, muy eh, tremenda y por el papel también del archivo, ya vimos muchas de las imágenes eh, impresionantes que nos trajo Philip, el papel del archivo en la escritura eh, de, de, de este libro en particular. It's a great question. This photograph caused me a lot of trouble in Japan. Um, I went, the book was published in Japan. I mean, I was amazed it's been published, I think, now in more than 25 languages. And I'd never been to Japan. And I went to an event, and then there were questions. And the first question was, why did you put a photograph of dead Hans Frank? in the photograph, in the book. We, he said, it was explained to me that in Japan we don't show pictures of dead people ever. So I explained to them and gave them an answer which left them literally with their mouths open. The photograph was given to me by Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. He actually showed it to me the first time I met him. He'd written a book which was, um, should we say, incendiary in Germany in 1988, called Der Vater, The Father, which was the most critical book a child probably has ever written about a parent, in which his deep hatred of his father runs over 300 pages. I read it with rapt attention. I thought I have to find this man. And I did find him and he agreed to give me a first interview in Hamburg. I went to visit him. I was very anxious because this was the son of the man who was hanged for killing my grandfather's entire family. This was 10 years ago. And we've become very good friends since. It's very curious. And he introduced himself. And the first thing he did was he took a photograph, this photograph, out of his pocket. I'm English, so I was, you know, it's, it's not normal behavior in England. <laughs> and, or probably in Chile. And I said, why are you showing this to me? He says, you have to understand, Philippe. I check every day to make sure that my father is really dead. Okay, fine. Then he said, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. So this is strong words. Anyway, time passed. I wrote the book. We made a movie together. And he said, I will give you all of my documents. I will give you the family home movies. I will give you letters. I will give you diaries. But I have one condition. That condition is that in your book, and if you do a performance that involves discussions of him in certain contexts, you must show my father dead. Okay? That is the simple answer. I would not have put the photograph in there, but it's my promise to Nicholas. Now, at one point, Nicholas said to me, Of course, you understand, not all the children of Nazis are like me. In fact, one of the amazing things I learned is all of the children of the top Nazis stay in touch, informally, not in association. They all know each other. And then it goes on beyond into the grandchildren. And he said to me, you're interested in Galicia and Wächter. I know the son. Would you like to meet him? He's different from me. He loves his father. He thinks his father is a great man who did no crimes, but you will like him. And that was how I met Horst Wächter. And this theme of the relationship between parent and child and grandparent and child, of course, anywhere where terrible things have happened, 
exists. This will be the same here in Chile. It will be the same in Argentina. It's, it's a common theme, but that's the simple answer to the photograph. I don't like the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Pero es impresionante que esté ahí. ahí. Hola, hola, buenas tardes, Philip. Eh, mi inglés no es tan bueno como para arriesgarme a perder la posibilidad de hacerte una pregunta. Eh, bueno, eh, nosotros nos conocimos ayer, yo te conté que tenía una doble militancia en, en Derecho y Literatura. Acá está presente también conmigo algunos miembros del equipo de las jornadas de Derecho y Literatura en esta universidad. Y al igual que Alia, mi, la cantidad de preguntas que, te, que tengo en mi mente para hacer son, es enorme, digamos. Pero, claro, va vinculada también a lo que tú mencionaste, a, la, a lo que mencionaste, Alia, sobre el trabajo con los archivos y sobre en qué mo en momento entra eh, la licencia poética o la licencia literaria en este trabajo de archivo. O sea, y que, eh, en el sentido de, claro, tú mencionas esta, esta pesquisa, esta investigación que presidió la escritura, y claro, ¿era acaso tu objetivo llegar a una especie de verdad verdadera? ¿O en cierto modo entra la, la, la licencia, la creación y la fabulación a partir de esta investigación? ¿Qué tanto entra, qué tanto no entra? ¿Y, y por qué, digamos? ¿Qué, qué, ¿O qué tanto permites tú, en tanto autor, que entre? Son varias preguntitas, pero creo que se entendió el, el, el marco, ¿no? Como a partir de este trabajo de archivo, digamos, si es que admites que entra, o de qué modo entra. Eso, gracias. So, earlier at the outset, had, incidentally, I love the idea of spending weeks on end sitting on your bedside table, <laughs> not knowing where I'm going to be put. But you're not the only one who had that problem. Um, curiously, It was initially a very difficult book to sell in Germany because it didn't fit any of the categories. And Germans like categories. <laughs> And they didn't know, I mean, what is it? Is it a law book? Is it a history book? Is it a memoir? Exactly your words. And I laugh a lot now with my wonderful editor at Fisher. You know, the internal battles she had as to who had responsibility for it. So I am a big reader. I read a lot. And I read a lot of international stuff, and I read fiction and non-fiction, and as you've told us, you've seen I even read poetry and other things. And, and I wanted to find a way to communicate ideas of some technical complexity to a wider intelligent audience. And I needed to find a voice to do that. And that, frankly, was a conscious decision, the style of writing, the tone, the fact that at no point in 500 pages of book do I express a single emotion. I describe simply what happens. And the technique that I wanted to take was to at no point impose on the reader my interpretation or my emotion so that each reader would come to her or his own assessment of what was being written. And so there is a purposeful act of detachment that takes place. And that didn't come with difficulty for me, because that's what I do when I'm in a court. The one golden rule when you are doing cases in international courts, including cross-examinations, the judge must never know what you personally think about what it is you are addressing. You don't say how terrible things are. You just lay out the facts. And less is more. So I very consciously wrote in that way. But I also have the incredible privilege of having many friends who are writers and neighbors. I was describing over lunch yesterday that one of my neighbors is a very famous writer of spy thrillers. A lot of people said to me, how, how can a book like this, you can't put it down? A lot of people, not everyone, but you just keep on wanting to read to see what happens next. So one of my neighbors is John le Carre. And for the last 20 years, 
my job with John le Carre's books is he'll turn up at the front door holding his manuscript and those of you who read John le Carre will know there are always lawyers involved in every book and I have a very narrow function to make sure that the lawyers speak, look, sound <laughs> like lawyers. But in the process of doing that, he doesn't give me a manuscript with little yellow stickies saying the lawyers are page 93 and the lawyers, you have to read the whole bloody thing. And in reading that whole thing, I think I've picked up in a subconscious way various techniques. And so to share with you one example of a technique. And the thing is, readers are really smart. This is the thing that I, this, you've got to treat your readers as incredibly smart. So you put at page 37 a name or a tiny point of detail, and the reader who is attentive will come to understand that every single thing that is there is there for a reason. And when 212 pages later, that point of detail comes back again, the carry will say, the magic of that moment is the reader thinks they are the only person in the world who has <laughs> spotted that point of connection. They feel good about themselves. <laughs> they feel they've understood the book. And there are other things that happen I think this has happened subconsciously, but I was extremely conscious of the style of writing. I have a wonderful editor in New York, Victoria Wilson. When I went to her, she bought the book. On, I completed a first draft, 500 pages. And it told the four lives intertwined from the beginning, 1914 to 1946. She said, no. My condition of buying this book is you completely rewrite it. And you will have to rewrite it in the following way. Um, part one, louder packed. Uh, part, part one, your grandfather. Part two, louder packed. Part three, Lemkin. Part four, Frank. Up to 1945. Then the reader will understand the difference between these men. They're all old, they're all white, they all come from the same part of the world. The reader will be completely confused. So you have to do it in a different way. And it was just a brilliant piece of editing. One which is premised on an understanding of how people read. Something else you touched on right at the beginning of what you said. So style is conscious absolutely conscious, um, but I didn't expect it to have the resonance that it would. It's a very personal book. Oh, the microphone is off. The interpreter is saying she can't hear. I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear her saying she can't hear. And I thought that was you speaking. <laughs> no. Ahí. Ahora, eh, yo compré este libro hace unos meses, por la, hace más tiempo, por la recomendación de John Le Carré y de Anthony Beaver, y que algo en la tapa me llamó la atención. Y estaba guardado entre los libros por leer. Pero un viaje a Polonia, que íbamos a hacer ahora en septiembre, dije, ahora es el momento de leerlo. Y, y lo hice leer a mi marido y, y me impactó. Pero ya que iba en el viaje a Polonia, y siendo yo un médico, decidí leer algo más y elegí el, el, el account de un doctor que trabajó con Mengele, un prisionero que trabajó en Auschwitz, que yo no lo conocía, pero en Londres, en camino a Polonia, agarré su libro, Miklos Nisli. Y él escribió sus memorias al sobrevivir a Auschwitz de cómo había sido trabajar de ayudante para Mengele. Y una de las cosas que se ve en el prefacio del libro es cómo lo criticaron de la frialdad con la que escribió sus memorias. Este era un médico que se dedicaba a anatomopatólogo, a hacer 
autopsia forénsica y Mengele lo necesitaba para su trabajo. Y mi pregunta, y me llamó la atención porque aún con lo frío que él no expresa ninguna emoción de los horrores que vivió, eh, el libro es impactante y intolerable y mi pregunta va dirigida a si existiría algún crimen como contra la humanidad aún en una categoría superior al genocidio que cubriría el tipo de cosas que hicieron los médicos que participaron, si eso le da desde el punto de vista suyo de, de jurista internacional a un grado aún de, no sé, mayor gravedad, si eso está tipificado, si existe algo peor que eso, para mí fue casi lo más difícil de toda la experiencia y solo fue to tolerable de leer porque él se mantuvo en su, eh, en su actitud de, de reporte de frío, de una autopsia de lo que estaba viviendo, que probablemente lo hizo para poder escribirlo, era intolerable hacerlo de otra manera, pero su profesión de médico, me llamó la atención, su profesión de médico se parece a lo que usted dice, yo estoy haciéndolo como lo hago en una, en un sal, en una sala de juicio. Mm. Pero mi pregunta específica mm. es, yeah. ¿qué hay yeah. de eso, de ese nivel aún mayor de, de delito? I mean, we've got our list of crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, that's the list, torture, you know, is there, but it's a crime against humanity and, and the, the law doesn't distinguish between actors. I mean, it may, when it comes to the penalty, if you're convicted, say that a medical doctor has a particular responsibility. As you probably know, in Nuremberg, there was a specific trial dedicated to the doctors, just the doctors, There was a specific trial just for the lawyers. And it was premised on the belief that certain people in society have a special responsibility which they have to honor at all times in relation to all people. But of course we know um, whether we're dealing with you know, the so-called war on terror after 9-11 or what happened in Chile and Argentina or what happened you know, when the UK was colonial power in Africa, in Kenya, and other places. They used lawyers to draft the rules, and they used doctors to be present at interrogations. That happened in this country. That happened in the United States at Guantanamo. We know that extraordinary rendition was, and the design of the torture techniques after September the 11th in 2001 The medics, the doctors, the psychologists, the psychoanalysts, the psychiatrists were deeply involved. And it is an accentuating feature, but it's not a separate crime. Um, and I understand what you're saying that, you know, for me, when I do a case, you see the most terrible things. And Uh, you learn somehow internally to detach yourself in some way um, and argue your case, write about your case um, in this horribly detached way, which some people don't like. I mean, I've had some critique about the book um, for a tone which some have said, I don't think it's right, that is disrespectful of victims because it fails to accentuate the extent of the horror that, that, they, that they suffered. I think it's actually the opposite, and I think that by adopting a detached voice, that's how you do it. But I respect the fact that different people have different views on how to do that. Um, yeah.
Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Felipe, buenas tardes. Mi nombre It's not working again. No. Why doesn't he come down and use this one? Yeah. Don't want to embarrass him. But... Sin presión. <laughs> ¿Puedo traer una silla también? Yeah. Um, buenas tardes, Felipe. Um, mi nombre es Felipe y también soy parte de la, del comité organizador de las Jornadas de Derecho y Literatura. Eh, primero quería agradecerte por tu exposición, que ha sido muy gratificante. Y luego um, quería preguntarte, a partir de tu labor como docente, ¿cuál piensas que es el rol de la lectura de novelas y poesía en la formación de jueces y abogados. Escuchábamos en tu exposición que hablaste de Raúl Zurita y, por ejemplo, pienso que la lectura y el estudio de el poemas como El canto a su amor desaparecido eh, sería importante para la formación de, de los estudiantes de Derecho. Eh, incluso eh, podría enseñarnos mucho más que varios tratados de Derechos Humanos. ¿Qué piensas al respecto? I mean, I've benefited hugely from being a big reader. Ali has been Ali has also studied law. Maybe you have a view. I'd like to hear what you say. I, I think lawyers generally write terribly. And the one thing we're never taught at law school is how to write. Um, and writing comes to some people very naturally, but to other people that it doesn't. And I think the idea of introducing into the law school environment, as some law schools do, I teach at Harvard each year, there's a creative writing course, and taught by writers who come, you know, to spend time with students, to understand essentially how to communicate, how to express yourself. Um, no one really taught me how to do that. I think I just picked it up from, from reading, but also, actually, I'd really be interested to know how Ali does it. So the way I write is I've noticed that if I'm speaking to an audience, and this must come from being a courtroom lawyer, I'm able to communicate much more clearly and elegantly when I'm speaking. And so I very often read out as I write. And it's plain because my wife tells me that I do it a lot. I spend a lot of time talking to myself aloud. And I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware that I'm doing that. But I think there's something about the act of communicating orally, by mouth, speaking, that forces you to communicate in a different way. And what I try to do when I write is to imagine how the words I put on a page are, would sound if I spoke them. And if I don't like a page that I've written, I will try to read it out and then make the corrections as to how I did it when I read it out. That's how, that's, that helps me to do it. But um, there are many lawyers who are novelists, actually, and, 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 and non-fiction writers. Um, in fact, there's a great piece of work to be done on the relationship between people who trained as lawyers and then went on to do something truly magnificent. I once sat, I, I have multiple lives, but I sit as an arbitrator um, in international disputes. And I once sat with a Canadian, a very elderly gentleman, and he had seen an article that I had written in the Financial Times, a long profile of probably my favorite poet and singer, Leonard Cohen. And he had read the article, and he said to me, do you want to hear something amazing? This guy was 77 years old. 
I said, yeah. He said, I sat next to Leonard Cohen at law school. I said, Leonard Cohen went to law school? He said, yeah. He only lasted one year. <laughs> he hated it. His father made him do it. And then he left. But in criminal law, I sat with him for a year. And I, I, there is a connection. I mean, you, you, say, you, you say something about it. Because there is a connection. Sí. Yo todavía me siento avergonzada y pido disculpas cada vez que digo, bueno, en realidad estudié Derecho. Y es como un, un momento de, 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 de un poco de incomodidad, ¿no? Eh, pero también en Chile hay una tradición bastante, bastante grande de, 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 de escritoras y escritores que han pasado por la Facultad de Derecho, que han resistido a la Facultad de Derecho. De la, yo estudié en la Universidad de Chile eh, y hay en, en la literatura latinoamericana muchos, la verdad. Es una, es una tradición que supongo que que empieza con un momento de resistencia y de desagrado muy profundo eh, y, que, y que después en algunos casos consigue algún, un, un, una convergencia. ¿no? Eh, pero yo, eh, al igual que tú, eh, Philip, eh, también es, eh, leo en voz alta eh, hasta aprenderme de memoria lo que, estoy, lo que estoy escribiendo y después tratar de olvidarlo de alguna manera. Son tal vez tics que tienen que ver con el derecho y el de entrenamiento, con la memoria, el ritmo. Eh, pero me pareció muy, muy interesante la, la pregunta con el rol que podría jugar la literatura como una especie de mmm, aprendizaje moral también, ¿no? Y no solamente estético, ético y estético en, en las facultades de Derecho, que creo que sería importante ir introduciendo cada vez más. Just as an anecdote, so my closest friend who is a writer, I don't know if he's been over here, is Hisham Matar. No, no. And a um, no. Libyan writer, friend of mine. And we have long conversations. I will say to Nishan, it's impossible. I can't carry on with doing all these different things, teaching my class, being a lawyer in front of international courts, sitting as a judge, writing. It's impossible. I, I have to stop being a lawyer. He says, no. The one thing you must not do is stop being a lawyer because the law nourishes you. The law gives you the source of your stories and your perception of human nature and character. Do less, but do not stop. Because if you stop, you will destroy the river that feeds you. And I think he's right. For me, he's right. It's different for different people but there's a plainly an interaction in my case. Okay, so let me barge in on that note. I have the unpleasant uh, responsibility to stop this conversation, <laughs> but uh, uh, this is a great sign. As I decided to stop, uh, five people asked me for the microphone. So it's a good time to stop when questions are their mm, intention. So, entonces quisiera agradecer eh, a los dos autores que tenemos acá presentes, quisiera contarles que eh, este maravilloso libro del cual hemos discutido bastante ya, más de una hora, está arriba, listo para que ustedes lo puedan comprar y bueno, aprovechar también la presencia de, del autor por si quieren algunas firmas, pero eso sí, las firmas las vamos a hacer fuera del estudio de televisión, porque la vida académica continúa, tenemos una clase afuera de gente eh, que está esperando, digamos, su lección. Pero, eh, y contarles que el próximo jueves tenemos eh, una, una conferencia de una periodista eh, científica colombiana que viene a hablar sobre la relación de la, eh, la narración, la investigación, el periodismo, con su responsabilidad por divulgar la ciencia. Su nombre es Ángela Posada Suáfort, va a ser el 10 de octubre. Octubre. Esa es la próxima cátedra. Pero hoy día, bueno, hoy día hemos tenido una excelente discusión acá, dos buenos textos y mejores anécdotas y reflexiones. Así que les pido por favor un aplauso para Alia Trabuco y también para Philip Sanz. Muchas gracias. <risa>